Welcome to Epicenter, episode 392. Today we have on with us Scoopy Truples, who is the co-founder of Alchemix. But before we talk to Scoopy about Alchemix, we'd like to tell you a bit about our sponsors this week. Exodus. Exodus is a easy to use wallet which supports hundreds of assets and has native apps for all platforms, including iOS and Android. And as a fully non-custodial wallet, they're firm believers in the not your keys, not your coins mantra. Go to exodus.com to give it a try. Next up, we have Paraswap. Paraswap just came out with a huge upgrade that's even faster and more liquid. It's cheaper than Uniswap and comes with a new gas token that can cut your gas fees by up to 50%. Go to paraswap.io slash epicenter. And finally, we have Solana. Solana is a next generation blockchain with lightning fast blocks and fees less than a cent per transaction. Scalability is perhaps the single biggest challenge preventing crypto from becoming the backbone to the world's financial system. And today, Solana may well be the best solution we have. Go to solana.com slash epicenter to learn more. All right. So, Scoopy, it's super awesome to have you on. You and I have like, you know, I feel like we've like chatted on like Twitter threads and stuff for a, a long time. I think I, I do this like thing where annually I, I figure out I run a script at the end of the year to see whose Twitter accounts I've liked the most, like the, whose tw- uh, tweets I've liked the most. And I think in 2020, you were like number like seven or eight on my list, and which is really cool because like this is the first time we're ever talking in person. Um, I think like probably everyone else on the list, it's like people I actually knew in person or something, but it's like you were. So this is really cool to finally get a chance to talk to you. So yeah, can you tell us a, just a little bit about yourself and like you know, I mean, okay, what one thing that people can probably obviously tell us, Scoopy Troubles is probably not your real name. So uh, tell us a little bit about how you got into crypto and why you use the name Scoopy Troubles. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's fun that we we interact on Twitter. Um, you know, I always love that you have like these random geography fact threads that uh, this continual thread. Um, it's a, always a highlight of my day to find to learn something new from you. Um, but how did I get into crypto? Yeah. Um, so it was, I mean, my journey like all the way started back in I think it was in 2011, and when I heard about the the Silk Road for the first time, there was like a giant expose. Um, it was like on, on Gawker and all sorts of internet websites, and you know I, I got interested in it, and I um, downloaded Tor browser, and I went to the Pirate Bay, and I found a website where I could buy Bitcoin, and I was like right about to hit the buy button and then i was just like nah i don't think i'm gonna do this this is weird this this internet money stuff you know it it sounds dumb and then i backed out and then so i sort of knew about bitcoin this entire time um didn't pay a ton of attention to it and then like in 2013 like a family member's like yo you got to get this bitcoin thing it just went up to like a thousand dollars and i'm like wait what (laughs) last time i checked it it was like a (laughs) dollar And so I thought, you know, I just missed it. I thought it was a bubble. And then I felt really vindicated when it crashed, you know, and it was in its bear market in like, you know, 2015 and 2016. And um, my, my wife was like, hey, Scoopy, we need to do some investing and, you know, start looking into that stuff. And at this time, I was like, oh, I wonder about this Bitcoin stuff. I know I was like following that a while ago. How's that doing? And uh, I, you know, I went down the rabbit hole and I learned more about it, you know, on a deeper level. Um, and I was like, you know what, let's do this. Like, you know, screw stocks. Let's let's go into Bitcoin. And so late 2016, I got into Bitcoin and 2017, I did what everyone else did. And they, you know, spent a lot of money on ICOs and coins that have fancy infographics that make it look like they have an ecosystem, but they really don't have an ecosystem at all. And then eventually I just kind of gravitated more and more towards uh, Ethereum, especially towards the end of 2017 and early 2018 when uh, dApps started becoming more and more popular on Ethereum. Um, I think CryptoKitties was my first dApp. And then I played around with stupid Ponzi uh, money games because that was the only thing out there uh, in 2018. There was no uh, like DeFi. But at that time, like, you know, even though these were like kind of stupid money games, it kind of got my, you know, my brain going like, whoa, you can do a lot of stuff with programmable money. And at that time, um, I wasn't a a developer, but I was like, you know what, let's go in, let's do this. And so I started learning how to code. Um, I became a web developer at that time, started getting some jobs 
for uh, you know Web 2.0 stuff using React. And then it was uh, summer of 2020. Um, one of my friends that I, I met in uh, Crypto Discord, so he's like, hey, I need a front-end developer for this app I'm making. Um, and at the time, it was called CheeseFi. This was uh, back in June before Sushi, before Yam, before any of the food token craze hit. We had CheeseFi. And um, it was actually very similar to uh, what ended up becoming Alchemix. It had some some pretty key differences um, that we decided uh, that we, we realized that would make it like non-viable as a platform. Essentially, what we would do for CheeseFi would you be you would uh, like lock up the uh, die for between ten and hundred days, and then you get this uh, cheese token in exchange for for doing that, and then the yield from your die would then go to buying off the cheese token from the market. Um, from Uniswap, and then we were like, you know, we thought it was a really cool model, but then we, we learned more about like MEV, minor extractable value, and sandwich attacks, and we realized that a lot of value could be extracted from that system. So we had to go back to the drawing board and create something different. Um, and then through that process, we we came across, uh, you know, what is now Alchemix. How did you kind of decide to go with the name like Scoopy Triples? I think. We actually were discussing this uh, right before the show. Uh, I think it would be really interesting to discuss with with viewers, like what what got you excited about that name um, specifically. Uh, all right. So um, in in Rick and Morty, there's uh, an episode where they go to Pluto, and because like uh, Jerry's adamant that it's a planet, even though everyone says it's not a planet, and like the ruler of that uh, of Pluto's name was a uh, Scroopy Nooples. And then later on, I like that name so much. I I, uh, I was playing Dungeons and Dragons, and I made this like silly character based off of uh, Scrooby Nooples, and that character's name <laughs> was called Scoopy Trooples. And then when it came time to make my Twitter account, uh, my normal handle that I use other places was gone, and I was like, "Huh, what can I use?" And I was like, "Oh, Scoopy Trooples. That's a, that's a fun name. Let's go with that one. That can be my new handle." And thus, Scoopy Trooples was born. And only blew up on Twitter recently, really, like in DeFi summer. I was like some nobody with like 100 followers for like the longest time. So what made you decide to uh, go like build this whole project anonymously? Like, you know, for like five years of Epicenter, surprisingly, we didn't have like any anon people. And then I think suddenly in the last like six months, we just had this like, you know, maybe I think we we might be like our third anon guest at this point. And it's like, and obviously, so there's this like larger trend in like, you know, anon uh, like bu- building anonymously. I mean, it, I guess arguably it's not a new trend. Or arguably it was the first trend in crypto as well from Satoshi. But w- w- why did you decide to do that? And what's been your like experience doing that? I definitely think like the ethos of crypto should be anon or pseudo anonymous. I mean, if you go back to the founder of it all, yeah, Satoshi Nakamoto was. But I mean, the reason for that is that You know, when you are holding crypto assets, you know, you're holding them like in your house, you know, you got your seed phrase, maybe, you know, backed up on a piece of paper or, you know, know, maybe a metal card if you're really precautious and, you know, somebody could, you know, easily just like break into your house and then rip off all of your, you know, all of your money, all your assets, you know, just by stealing some words on a piece of paper from you. And with that in mind, like I, I, I'm anonymous for my own safety. Like, I, I don't want uh, to expose me or my family or anybody, you know, who's close to me, uh, you know, to my dealings in crypto. You know, if word got out that, you know, my who, who I am in real life is Scoopy Trooples, then, you know, it might make people that I love and I care about targets, also including myself. And there's also the thing that, like, I haven't told, like, anybody in my really, like, close family and friends about Scooby Trooples or Alchemix because I like to kind of separate that life from, you know, or that that from, you know, my normal life because I don't want people to treat me any different than they have treated me in my entire life just because they think I have money. And so, you know, for safety and my own personal reasons, I, I choose to be uh, anonymous. I, I mean, I'm surprised that there's not more anonymous founders out there because uh, I think like, you know, putting your name out there and your face out there is kind of dangerous. One thing I wanted to kind of dive into was uh, the mechanism design itself of Alchemix. How would you describe to someone hearing for the first time 
what alchemics is at, at a high level um, and what the main kind of use case uh, it provides for DeFi is. Okay, so at a basic level, the way alchemics works is that you deposit dye into the system um, and then you can use the, that dye as collateral to mint our own synthetic stablecoin, AlUSD. Um, and you can uh, borrow up to uh, 50% of the amount of collateral that you have. So if you put in 100, you can borrow 50. And then what happens is that the dye uh, that you deposit gets deposited into uh, yearn.finance into their uh, dye vault. And that earns around, uh, around 15% interest a year. And what happens is that the principal from your deposit is earning yield, and that gradually pays off your AlUSD debt over time. And then that harvested yield also goes to a module that we call the, the transmuter, which acts as a backstop to the peg. Um, so if for some reason um, AlUSD is trading at under the peg, on our curve market, then you could go to the transmitter module and guarantee a one-to-one -one conversion for um, from AlUSD to DAI. Um, other things for the transmitter that fill it up are when people repay their loans in DAI. So um, a lot of people have been you know, with Alchemix, you're, you're not locked in at any time for any amount of time. So you can always repay your debt um, and then exit your collateral from the system. So whenever anybody pays in DAI, whether that's through uh, direct wallet payments or if they liquidate their uh, DAI collateral to pay their debt, um, that DAI gets sent to the transmitter. And the cool thing about the transmitter is that it takes all of its DAI and puts it into yearn. And then that yield from the transmitter is then passed along to the depositors in our vault. So it boosts their APY because we have an effectively higher principal than, uh, than just the deposits themselves because of the uh, transmitter. So that's how we can get like 25% interest, whereas Yearn is getting like 15%. Let's get to our sponsor, Exodus. Exodus is a fantastic cryptocurrency wallet that strikes the right balance between ease of use, security, and great features. You can get Exodus on the iPhone, desktop app, web app, Android, whatever platform you use. It's a non-custodial wallet, and that is so critical. Because what's the point of crypto if you don't control your own assets? With Exodus, you always do. They're old school and they've been around since 2015. Over 1.2 million users rely on Exodus, so you know that they've stood the test of time. They have support for over 100 different crypto assets. And from within Exodus, you can easily change one different asset to the other. They also allow you to buy crypto with fiat. And they even have a great offer where you can buy up to $500 worth of crypto through their iOS app and pay just $1 in fee. So go to exodus.com slash epicenter and check out their wallet. We want to thank Exodus for their amazing support of Epicenter. So the die that gets uh, earned from urine, you know, so does a portion of it go to start paying off debt and a portion goes to the transmuter or is it somehow, like what percent is going where? This is a little bit tricky since we have our own synthetic uh, stablecoin, AlUSD. When we harvest the yield from urine, we reduce amount of everyone's debt like globally in the system when that happens. But we don't actually have to pay the die to like the, the users at this point. The die, that die just ends up going straight to the transmitter. So all of it goes to the transmitter and it, it decrements everyone's debt at the same time. There is a 10% fee that Alchemix charges on uh, yield harvests. Um, and that's kind of our rake. That's our take. That's our uh, project fees that we take. Um, and we have to do that. Um, at the bare minimum, we'd have to do that just to pay for the fees for harvesting because uh, it's not cheap to run an app on Ethereum. Gas is very expensive. And, and some of the processes that we do is uh, we don't have users call these functions. Uh, instead, we kind of batch it all together. And uh, we, uh, the people running the protocol, you know, the dev team, we, we you know, pay that cost for the, our users. How do people uh, earn from the transmuter? Is everyone who has LUSD like earning from it? Or do people have to actually deposit into the transmuter? 
So the transmitter is not really a, a vehicle for, for yield or earnings. It's just a, a, like a guarantee that you can redeem your AliUSD for DAI. And we only really see usage of that when um, the curve pool uh, that we have gets a little bit imbalanced and there's uh, more ALCX token or uh, AliUSD tokens than the, uh, the, the curve tokens or the, uh, the kind of curve meta pool tokens, the three pool. So whenever there's like an imbalance there, we might see people use the transmuter, which kind of acts as like the uh, backstop of the peg. Um, but that, that's like in the event that like uh, AliUSD falls off the peg like really badly, then people could like buy AliUSD off the market, then uh, put it in the transmuter. And that could be like a source of yield if you tr treat AliUSD as a bond. But other than that, no, it's just a, a redemption model, uh, you know, method of way to backstop the peg. So it's not really meant for yield. Um, but the transmitter itself does deposit its over 200 million die into urine and then, you know, passes on that yield to our users. Would you say it's safe to characterize the main use case people are using Alchemics for is getting extra yield? You mentioned 25% relative to 15%. Or have there been like other really interesting use cases that have surprised you that came off the protocol? Yeah, so I mean, a lot of people, what they're you know, they're just depositing in there and just earning yield on it. But for for, for the most part, people are um, taking on AlUSD loans, and some people are using it for personal finance, where they're they're selling the AlUSD for like USDC, then and then uh, exiting it off of uh, Coinbase. Um, I know um, I've confirmed that we've had some people do this. Uh, somebody bought a boat for their dad using an Alchemix loan. Uh, I know a guy bought a Porsche. I know somebody who's paid for their grad school tuition using an Alchemics loan. Um, also, um, somebody paid their, their hospital bill for their newborn son uh, by financing it through an Alchemics loan. Um, and other than personal finance, a lot of people, what they're doing is they're either uh, selling the AlUSD and you know, investing in you know, speculating in the market, or they're taking their AlUSD and then supplying like, liquidity on Curve and then earning ALCX that way. So some people are, you know, using it for finance, other people are speculating, and other people are just trying to maximize their yield farming even more. So on that personal finance use case, one thing I'm a little bit confused about is what's the use case of borrowing a stable coin against over collateralized stable coin. So like, you know, people often will use like maker or compound because to borrow USD, but they put down collateral in, you know, ETH or BTC or something because they're trying to maintain, you know, exposure to the uh, collateral asset. And also that, you know, there's often like tax benefits as well uh, to doing this. But why would I put down Two hundred dollars of a stable coin just to borrow a hundred dollars of a stable coin instead of just selling or spending my original stable coin. So a lot of times, like when you have your own savings and stuff like that, and then like an expense in life comes up, you have to make a choice between consumption and and saving. Um, whereas with Alchemics, you can do both. You can both save and spend, save and consume. So let's say um, you have a thousand dollars saved up. Um, that's your rainy day fund. And then you get into a car accident and it turns out the bill for this car accident is going to be $500 to fix it. If you were to pay that out of pocket, you'd be left with $500 uh, of savings. And let's say you go ahead and you put that $500 in DeFi and you're making, you know, 15, 20% a year on that. That's great. Right. But with Alchemics, what you could do is you could put your thousand dollars in it, take out that $500 loan, and then you could be earning interest on the thousand dollars that you put in so you'd have a larger principal that's earning yield paying off your loan so by the time that the loan is paid off you'll have a thousand dollars where if you paid out of pocket for that car accident and then you invested that that five hundred dollars in DeFi, and then it you know compounded over two years you'd be looking at maybe like seven hundred dollars seven fifty but with alchemics you'd be ending up with a thousand dollars the example I said was like, you know, sometimes you want to maintain exposure. The reason you'd borrow against your ETH is you want to maintain exposure to ETH and you think ETH is going to go up. Here, it kind of it's actually is somewhat similar, but you're basically saying, hey, I want to maintain exposure to 
it's not really a stable coin. It's a yield earning stable coin because in DeFi at this moment, even stable coins can like give you quite a high return. Alchemix helps you maintain exposure to this like high yield earning stable coin and you're borrowing this low yield earning stable coin, which is the uh, Al USD. Is that is that essentially what's happening here? Yeah, I'd like to think of Alchemix as like a savings technology in a lot of ways where you're encouraged to both save and spend. You're, uh, by saving, it's giving you uh, access to you know, your, you know, a, a greater and greater line of credit. So it's encouraging you to save. And it's also kind of putting a limit because you can, uh, there's like a 200% collateralization ratio. Let's say you save up a million bucks and then you go into Alchemix, you can take out $500,000. So it's not like you're going to be able to spend all of your your money. Um, this is important because let's say uh, you know the yields on Alchemix dry up, or you need your collateral back for something in real life, and you want to get out. You can pay off your loan. Let's let's say like if you you still have your AlUSD, AlUSD, or you converted it to Dai, you can pay off your loan uh, from your wallet, or you can liquidate your collateral, so you can get out. It gives you a little bit more optionality in your spending. So if you wanted to, you could just have that debt repay itself or you could repay it yourself manually. And if you repay it yourself manually, yeah, you get a little extra gains from, you know, the extra principal, but it'd be pretty similar to paying out of pocket. But the whole idea is it gives you that optionality. You can essentially get a line of credit that pays itself off and that that lets you just like kind of take risks and do things and spend money like kind of in a guilt-free way because I know like I'm a saver naturally and I always like hate to take money out of my savings or out of my investments to you know to buy something or to fund my real life um, and with Alchemix I, I feel like I'm not forced to make that decision anymore I can just be like hey I'm just going to take out a loan that's going to pay itself off it in fact, what I do for my own personal finances, I have a decent amount of dye in Alchemix, and I just draw some monthly, and then that pays like all my uh, house and uh, family bills. And at the end of the month, I have almost no debt, and then I just take another loan out and then just repeat the process. So when you're looking for a flight, you go to a flight aggregator to see all the different places where you can buy the flight, to get all the options and make sure you get the best price for your travel plans. And when you're making a DeFi swap, just do the same and use Paraswap. It beats the market prices across all the major DEXs because it aggregates them and thanks to their network of professional market makers, you get zero slippage on your trades. So they just pushed a huge update that's even faster, more liquid thanks to a brand new algorithm. Paraswap is now multi-chain and has expanded to Polygon and Binance Smart Chain. So go and check it out. Give Paraswap a try at paraswap.io slash epicenter. Where do you see AlUSD within DeFi? It seems like you see it as a tool for borrowing in a guilt-free way in the kind of way that you mentioned. But do you see it like as a major stable coin for DeFi? Like how do you see it being composed upon? Uh, and what do you see its role in the like whole stable coin ecosystem that already exists in DeFi? Yeah, yeah, we're working actively on trying to get more integrations for AlUSD. Um, first step from that one is getting uh, reliable uh, uh, price feeds for AlUSD. Right now, we're only on the curve um, and uh, factory pools, and they don't have like any sophisticated uh, TWAPs or oracles associated with that. Um, so we're trying to work with Chainlink um, to get a price feed for um, our uh, ecosystem tokens. And once that happens, we're going to be able to get AlUSD on places like um, like Aave, like uh, Rarys Fuse, and other lending mo uh, markets like Cream as well. Um, but I think more interestingly uh, than just having it being like a, a, a collateral or capital asset is that you could um, we could work with like margin protocols or options protocols, and then you could use AlUSD to fund those positions. And then if you if you're borrowing that in a loan that repays itself, then you can, you can go short, you can go long, and be as degen as you want to, and know that you know even if you lose, even if you get wiped out, you know you still have your collateral um, that you use to get your AlUSD loan, and that debt will vanish over time. So I think that's kind of cool. It's like a an idea of safe aping. Could you clarify that again? So so 
uh, you think people can put down dye and then borrow Alchemix, sell that Al Alchemix in exchange for borrow bur Al AlUSD. Alchemix is the oh sorry yeah yeah, yeah. AlUSD. So so people can put down dye into Alchemix, borrow AlUSD against it, um, and they can sell that AlUSD and buy with it options or some other kind of derivative instrument and that's as you said like kind of a guilt-free experience is that kind of what you're you're envisioning well what we're trying to work for is getting um LUSD so integrated into DeFi that you wouldn't have to sell it for another stable coin is that you could go straight into that options contract or into that margin position using LUSD that's that's the goal right there is to get to that point where it can start to be used across D5 and different use cases and stuff. Right. Because right now I can go to like margin swap, I can go to DYDX, I can go to you know various platforms and and lever you know my 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 stable coins, so I can do other things in DeFi with them, right? And AlUSD does not have that just yet, you know, because it's still early in the days for it. Uh, but once we get those integrations in, it'll you know start to drive more of the demand side for uh, the currency itself because it'll have a lot more uses instead of just flipping for DAI or USDC or Tether or some other stable coin. And I think that's an important part of uh, having long-term peg stability is to uh, you know take care of that demand side. Essentially, if that happens, AlUSD is going to be competing then with things like DAI and USDC and stuff for like usage within DeFi. And isn't it actually going to drive down the the yields you can earn on like DAI? Because like, you know, right now, let's say, you know, right now, let's say on uh, with with on your let's say put depositing in curve is one of the highest uh, sources of yield. Right. And that's because, like, you know, one of the most incentivized pools on Curve is that, like, three pool uh, with DAI, USDT, and USDC. But now let's, let's imagine a world where AlUSD becomes, like, you know, the fourth big stable coin in DeFi, right? Wouldn't that actually then drive down yields on DAI now because it's only getting a quarter of the Curve rewards rather than a third of them? And, and essentially, the question is, as. AlUSD becomes more popular, does not drive down the yields from other stable coins. I think this is a really tough one to predict because like kind of what, what determines the, the yield of a stable coin, there's a, there's a ton of factors involved. Um, you know, a lot of that, you know, because Yearn uses um, seven different strategies in their dive vault for, uh, you know, for, for version two um, of their vaults. And, and one of the strategies is to, to LP into to that curve pool that you just mentioned. Um, but they also have a, a number of other strategies. So I, I, I'm not really sure that we would, you know, if LUSD became, you know, a huge market, you know, cap that we would dilute that. I mean, that's sort of saying like, you know, there's a stable coin out there, USDN, and that has like an insane amount of curve gauge weight. Is is USDN taking yield away from DAI? You know, like, I feel like the answer is yes and no, because they might be taking some of the curve rewards away from that that that, that three pool curve and, dilute, and lowering the yields for DAI. But at the same time, then people also balance their positions based on the yield. So the market reacts to that. So the appropriate amount of capital will be allocated to places to get that yield. So if, if the desired yield is 10% and then you see it's 5% somewhere, you're not going to put your, your, your stable coins in there. You're going to try to find somewhere else. So I think it, it'll balance itself out. And I don't think LUSD would have a major impact on die yields. I haven't given this a ton of thought, to be honest. I mean, I might want to come back and issue like a, you know, a deeper thought on this on Twitter for you sometime soon, Sonny. But my gut feeling is that I don't think we would have any significant impact on dyes uh, yields. That said, though, on version two of Alchemix, uh, which is uh, slated to come out in two to three months, we will be adding multiple collateral types. So you'll be able to put in DAI, USDC, USDT, SUSD, uh, you name it, any viable stable, stable coin that has some good on-chain yield. Um, they'll all be collateral um, assets for uh, LUSD. So... We'll be we'll be siphoning yield from all of the stable coins in the future someday. <laughs>
Let's get to our sponsor, Solana. Now, this is a special ad for me to read because I've been a deep supporter of this project since meeting the Solana team back in 2018. I invest personally in the project and my company, Course One, is super deeply involved in the Solana ecosystem, including running the biggest validator. So what's so cool about Solana? Well, we all know that scalability is the single most important issue facing the blockchain industry today. And the Solana blockchain is an amazing solution for it. The network supports thousands of transactions per second with 400 millisecond block times and over 500 validators. The special thing about Solana is also that it's not a sharded blockchain. It's a single blockchain hyper optimized for performance. So that makes it really easy to maintain composability between all of the apps on Solana so that they work together seamlessly now and forever. The Solana ecosystem is growing at a rapid pace and it's a great place to build your project or just get involved with the community. So go to solana.com slash epicenter to learn more. What does happen in Alchemix when the when the the yields go down? So right now, let's just say as an example, the yield on DAI is twenty five percent a year, and you know it'll take about two years for you know if let's say you bought, you put down a hundred dollars of DAI, you borrow fifty dollars of LUSD, it'll take about approximately two years to pay off that entire loan. But now let's say the suddenly you know all uh urn like you know the yields drop to from 25 percent to five percent and now this loan suddenly takes 10 years to pay off how does that change where does that affect like you know get reflected in the alchemic system like I'm, i imagine that has to propagate somewhere in the alchemic system is does it affect the al usd price does it affect yeah where, where does that effect get seen does it change the collateralization ratio needed Mm, at the most basic level, um, it'll mean that your debt repayment times will take longer. You know, the system should still work uh, fine, but uh, because the debt repayments are taking longer, the amount of yield flowing into the transmitter would be lower. So in the event that we do destabilize, you know, and we, we break our peg and stuff like that, uh, and then let's say people use the transmitter and they use everything that's in the transmitter and it goes down to zero, um, at that point, then, you know, LUSD then would become like a, a bond of sorts and it would still have value and it still trade at the market in the market, but you might take a discount when you sell it, or you could then purchase it from the market and then, you know, uh, put it in the transmitter and it would gradually turn into, to die over time. So that, that's what we, you know, worst case scenario we see happening in, in the event uh, that yields collapse, but if yields collapse for urine, they're probably going to collapse everywhere um, because they are incredibly flexible and they have a you know very competent team of uh, top-notch developers and strategists who are heavily incentivized to find the best yields because they earn profit off of them. Uh, I'm still confident that urine will have very competitive you know yields in relation to other projects in DeFi. But that said, yeah, definitely lower yields would or could negatively impact the peg. Um, we're not sure exactly how much would happen to there. It depends. It really depends on if the peg itself breaks. If it doesn't, and our liquidity incentives and the demand to supply you know, liquidity to our, our curve pools and other markets that we'll have in the future, if that's good enough and the peg can hold, then it'll just mean that debt repayment times will take longer. But um, you know, if the peg does break, then we would be in a little bit of a precarious situation. Um, so that is a risk, uh, just being straight up with you guys. Why is the peg holding today? Like, why, from my understanding, it feels to me that it should be, LUSD should actually probably be treated as a bond even right now. So, and so should probably be trading at a slight discount. Like, there's a time value to the money, right? And so, like, Yes, you can convert it at one to one on the transmuter, but you know, at some future time. And why is that not reflected in the price of LUSD today? So right now, LUSD, um, there's a supply of around 330, 340 million LUSD out there, and currently there's around 220 million die in the transmuter. 
So uh, roughly two thirds of the LUSD out there is backed completely one to one that you can redeem it. But the other part is, is that these are over collateralized loans too, like at the end of the day. So just like MakerDAO has over collateralized loans, just like Liquidity has over collateralized loans, you know, we, we kind of have the same thing. So it's not only like, you know, the, the die and the transmitter that's backing it, but it's also the, the, the die that's collateral that's backing it as well. And the fact that people can, you know, repay their debt at any time. So like if you borrowed LUSD and then you're, you know, you're trying to earn on it and then you see that, you know, its price goes down, you would just feel like, all right, I'm going to take my LUSD out and pay down my loan because these, these tokens aren't is worth as much. And, and that right there itself is, is a pegging mechanism because when you pay off with LUSD, it destroys it. Um, you know, and then that takes it off the market and, you know, will help it bring it back towards more towards equilibrium. So I hope that answers your question. I, the other part of why it's holding the, the dollar uh, peg so strong is, yeah, we are uh, incentivizing liquidity on curve. We uh, if you stake the the the. The LUSD three curve LP tokens on our website, you can earn uh, close to forty percent uh, APY on uh, in the form of ALCX tokens. Um, our audit from Certic just came back, and that's going to allow us to get on Curve.fi, and we'll be able to have access to the Curve gauges as well. So that will um, add another source of yield for our stakers um, and uh, depositors. I think it's. It's like the magic of the transmuter coupled with the fact that, you know, we have these liquid markets that are incentivized that is keeping this peg up. So that makes sense that you can earn Alchemix tokens by like depositing into the curve pool. But, and, you know, curve heavily incentivizes things to be priced one to one. Uh, but at the end of the day, even on curve, things can still be, you know, the price of our. Uh, uh, Al USD could still be less than one dollar relative to the other tokens in the pool, uh, and as long as all you're checking is that, hey, is there liquidity in the pool? So why is no one arbitraging, or and like kind of even moving the curve pool to be at whatever like a properly priced bond should be? Um, I don't think there's really any incentive to to do that. There is no arb there, you know, for it right now. And if you tried to manipulate it in in bring the price of LUSD down, that would just completely get arbed away because people would say, hey, you know, I can, you know, buy, you know, LUSD for 98 cents and then transmute it, you know, and get, uh, you know, a dollar for it, you know, for 98 cents and they can get some instant yield that way. And we've actually seen that this week um, with the um, ETH crashing in price since uh, ALCX is tied to ETH in our sushi swap market. We've also gone down with ETH as well. And because of that, um, our yields have gone down. So we've seen people exit uh, the uh, the liquidity pools. Uh, we've seen maybe like I think we had like 600 million liquidity there last week, and now we have around 550 million. Um, and at the same token, um, since a lot of people were pulling out their Dai or their three pool curve tokens from that pool, uh, there was a bit of an imbalance in um, how USD went down to like. 99.5 cents whereas before it was uh, roughly like you know it might, i think it was trading at a slight premium to die at the time before that and then because there was that little arb uh, people were then starting to use the transmuter and we lost you know and transmuter had some funds uh, uh taken from it uh during this uh this period as well um, so, but the peg held, it's still very strong, um, and things seem to be, uh, in an equilibrium right now, and we're not seeing those outflows anymore. So I think that's just the system working as intended. How long does it take for transmutation, at least like in that case that you talked about, uh, with die peg breaking to like, you know, 95 cents, um, or, or sorry, the Al USD peg breaking to 95 cents relative to die? How long does it take to transmute like LUSD into DAI? Um, at minimum, it's going to take 50 blocks um, because we um, we put the um, distribution of the uh, the DAI uh, for LUSD uh, depositors and the transmitter to take a little bit longer. So that way people wouldn't be able to like grief it if they like called harvest and then they could, you know, uh, then immediately get that DAI. And, you know, so in order to stop that, yeah, we have that split uh, spread over 50 blocks, but usually that happens whenever somebody 
those that will start flowing to your account when uh, we either harvest yield or somebody repays their debt and die. Now, there is another function that you can use to transmute faster. It's called force transmute. It's kind of an, a, a bit of an advanced uh, function, um, and it's really only for Etherscan Pro users. Um, basically, you'd have to query an Ethereum address that's staked into the transmuter. It's possible that you can have too much DAI allocated to a position. Let's say I put in 100 um, LUSD. Um, there's a little uh, box in there that says uh, the amount of transmutable uh, dye I have. Um, if I have put in 100 LUSD, then I have 100 transmutable dye. It'll just uh, you know burn the 100 LUSD and give me 100 dye when I hit the transmute button. But it's possible uh, with our current design for the transmuter for you to have 100 LUSD deposited and then have more than 100 LUSD that are 100, more than 100 transmutable dye. Um, I could have a million transmutable die, in fact, like on a hundred uh, position. And what you can do is you can force transmute somebody who's over allocated. And when that happens, all of their excess allocated die goes straight to your allocated die. So it's sort of like an incentivized cron job. Um, there's a handful of people we know in the ecosystem that kind of uh, take care of this and they've been, you know, we, we don't know who they are, but they figured out this, uh, this force transmute system. And uh, they have been arbing the peg uh, here and there, which is actually a kind of a service for everybody in the ecosystem because, you know, they're helping, uh, you know, bring stability to the price of LUSD. We did try to implement that into the, um, the UI, uh, but we were having some issues with our graph and it wasn't reliable. So we just like cut it from the UI. But um, occasionally what we'll do if we notice like, you know, people like my, my die isn't transmuting. We'll, we'll force transmute a couple positions and then transmute ourselves. And then that will disperse the, the yield evenly to everyone else in the system kind of immediately at that time. Uh, so w one question, I, I didn't fully understand. What is the situation? How do you get yourself into a situation where the, your die allocated is greater than your uh, LUSD? How do you get into a situation where you can be forced uh, transmuted? Um, so this was like a, kind of like a computer science problem is that, uh, imagine like, um, you know, the dye that's flowing into the transmuter is like rain falling from the sky and your staking position, uh, your, your deposit for LUSD is like a bucket. And of course, when the bucket's full, you would expect it to, you know, not overflow or anything like that. It would just be full. Right. But because Ethereum is the way that it is. <laughs> uh, and you can't like have like you know kind of code like self-execute you always have to like you know pay the gas and push that button to do it we we, we couldn't find a problem or a solution at the time for uh that term uh, terminality uh for ending the, the the you know the distribution for people who are like um overfilled and so we were kind of scratching our heads we were playing around with an epoch model and other things like that and then um one of our devs had made like a, an app from like back in 2018. And it's like, Hey, what if we repurpose this code for the transmuter? And it's like, well, if we do that, then it's going to overfill. And it's like, well, what if uh, we turn, you know, an overfill position, uh, let somebody else be able to uh, transmute that. Then we could just send the divs over or the uh, allocation over to them. And that would be like an incentivized cron job. And so we're trying to use crypto token or economics to solve a, a computer science problem, essentially. The good news is that in our version two, we have figured out this problem and we're not going to have to do this, uh, this awkward force transmute, uh, kind of like, you know, work around to get the system working and it'll, it'll just, it'll just work and it'll be simple and it'll be nice. I mean, that's a pretty clever solution. I like that. I, I, I now, okay, now I understand with the whole, that's, that's pretty cool. I mean, before the system we had, it was it was untenable where you'd have to stake your LUSD weekly and then claim whatever got transmuted weekly and then restake it. <laughs> and, you know, when we were kind of testing that um, before we launched, like I, I just hated it. I'm like, no, nobody's going to do this. Nobody's going to spend, you know, you know, five hundred dollars in gas for, you know, an undetermined payout every week. That's why we, we switched it. It's not perfect, but uh, it works at the time, and we have a much better solution going forward. So, I don't know. If this is, you might not. This might not be what you want to hear. But what this somewhat almost reminded me of was 
So I'm very familiar with Faye. And this, like, slightly reminded me of Faye in some ways, where, especially in the case where Faye is over collateralized, where, you, you know, which it is currently, right? Like, currently in Faye, the, pre- the, the coll- ETH collateral that it has is much higher than the uh, outstanding, like, stablecoin liabilities it has. And their premise is that, you know, we can keep this peg going as long as possible because anyone who wants out can get out at, at any time. And we're able to do this and we can keep this going for as long as possible because the ETH price is going to, as long as the ETH price is going to keep going up, we're going to continuously keep having a way for the people who want out to get out when they want to get out. It seems that this is actually very similar in a lot of ways, but instead of depending on the ETH price going up, here it's depending on the uh, yearn yields, right? As long as the yearn yields are like, earning money, we'll have enough money, the protocol will have enough reserves to let the people who want to go out be able to go out. Uh, and what's nice, as opposed to in Faye, it's like this collateral is lower bounded at the, the hopefully the, the interest rates on, on, on yearn don't go negative, right? Like, I mean, you know, in traditional TradFi, we do actually have negative interest rates. But, you know, at least on hopefully on yearn, the prices, sh- the it should never go negative, and it's certainly at least it's lower bounded at zero. While in the Fay case, you know, the price it, there's a situation where the protocol can become under collateralized as well. I, I didn't really think about that comparison, but yeah, yeah, I guess um, where they're backed by ETH, uh, you know, collateral buying power to buy back everything, we're powered by, you know, die yield being able to buy back everything. Um, the the cool thing about Alchemix is that, like, you know. You know, you you could use it by yourself. You could be the only participant in it. It wouldn't make much sense if that were the case, but you could, because you know your your die collateral is locked until either you repay your debt or the um, or uh, you know the yield is uh, is paid off itself, or you know, the yield pays off the debt itself. So like, you know, even if like you know it takes ten years for you know your loan to mature and nobody's using the system and you're just holding this Al USD out there and you don't know what to do with it, eventually you will be able to redeem that for die. So there is always that guarantee that we're going to be able to make you whole um, in Alchemix. It just might take a long time uh, in the worst case scenario, um, and that's actually something we really really care about. Um, you know, a lot of us uh, came from like DGen money games, um, and we didn't like the fact that so many people were getting wrecked. Or the fact that if somebody had to, if somebody won, that meant somebody else had to lose um, in those games. And so, with Alchemics, we thought, how can we make it so that we can make everybody whole again, no matter what, no matter what happens? And other than a yearn hack, you know, of the uh, of the vault that we're using, I, I don't see a scenario where anybody can actually lose money using our system. What's the long term vision that you have for Alchemics? Where do you see yourself in five years, 10 years as part of this like DeFi story? Are there like new products in that? I can imagine like ETH as collateral. Yeah. What, what's the, the long-term vision for you? We're, we're targeting this month. We might, it might slip in the next month. Uh, we're we're going to be launching um, Al ETH. It'll work very similar to Al USD um, where you deposit ETH and you can take out a, an Al ETH loan. It might have some different parameters, like it might have a different collateralization ratio because ETH yield is lower than DAI yield. So we don't want, you know, somebody to be in there and then have a loan, you know, be 15 years to take off or pay off. So we, we might increase the collateralization ratio for that one. And we're playing around with some other parameters as well. But that should be out um, relatively soonish. And the Al ETH is, I think, is a really cool one uh, because you can you know, lever up on your ETH, or you can even, you know, use it as a, as a cashing out method or a way to short ETH or to hedge it. So I think it's going to open up a lot of really interesting use cases. Um, then after um, we get Al ETH out, we're um, heads down focused on getting our version two out, which will open up a multi-collateral um, uh, Alchemix, essentially. So there'll be, you know, for Al USD, multiple stable coins that can be used as the collateral. And the cool thing is like, you can like make a composite position of a lot of different stable coins in Alchemix. Uh, imagine each stable coin as an ingredient and you can customize or you can make your own recipe uh, using the different ingredients and different balances that you want to. So if you want like a position that's 30% DAI, 50% USDC, 20% Tether, you could do that if you want to. 
Um, and then as you do that, you can see like which stable coins are offering the best yields and stuff like that. And you can uh, construct your, uh, your position that way. So that, that's one cool thing about uh, version two. And the, the same property will also be there for um, Al ETH. And we're also going to be launching Al Bitcoin as well. And that'll take like various uh, flavors of Bitcoin on Ethereum. And then from there is um, right now in Alchemix V1, we launched um, unaudited and we were unsure of um, any uh, security issues with uh, economic exploits. So we locked down um, smart contracts from interacting with uh, Alchemix. So we would prevent like flash loans and things like that. Um, some unknown stuff. Good news is that we got our audit back and everything came uh, back really good. No critical issues were found. So, uh, you know, funds are safe. <laughs> <laughs> but going forward in Alchemix V2 is we're going to uh, remove that restriction and it's going to be a lot more composable. And then we're going to be building modules on top of it. Um, I can't get into detail about too much about those. Um, I, I did say that I did leak on the Bankless podcast earlier that one of the modules is going to be for delegated credit. So like when you deposit DAI, then you have like a, a credit of Al USD that you can take out. Um, you know, this new module that we're going to be working on is going to allow you to then let somebody else borrow that Al USD from you. Um, I don't want to go into too many details about the system, uh, but I think that's going to be something that's really powerful. Um, we're also uh, working on a, a handful of or a few other uh, modules. Um, and the one that I am leading and designing is uh, Alchemix DAO. Um, and that's going to bring a cash flow model to uh, the ALCX tokens. Uh, and for, for participants in the DAO, it's, we're going to be experimenting with conviction voting, um, borrowing um, some of uh, the security module from Aave. So like... Uh, if something happens uh, to the protocol and we suffer a loss, um, ALCX takers in the DAO could get slashed and their token sold at auction to uh, make the protocol whole again. So there'll be you know security and insurance model uh, baked into the DAO, and uh, it's going to be um, executing code. You know, so the DAO itself. Right now, we have a, um, a multi-sig uh, community and developer multi-sig uh, with a time lock and governance via snapshot, but the uh, the DAO itself will you know execute the code, unlike the, uh, the semi-trusted setup we have right now. Um, and so we're going to be uh, borrowing heavily from the governor alpha contract from uh, Compound. So we're going to be mixing all those things together to make something new. Um, and also the goal is to, to gamify it and turn it into something kind of cool and unique uh, that hasn't been done before. So please look forward to that when it comes out after V2 later this year. Into 2022, we're going to be expanding the use cases of Alchemix by adding more modules, uh, trying to secure more integrations in DeFi. Uh, the holy grail is to get an Alchemix credit card where you could, you know, it'll take your stablecoin deposits and then you'll just have access to this, uh, you know, line of credit that you can use for spending um, that actually might be in the cards. I don't want to say too much now, but yeah, we, we know some people that might be able to get this, uh, that get, get, get it going. And a lot of the members of the team are also really into um, NFTs and gaming and stuff like that. And that's something that I think our team, um, uh, as the Alchemix uh, you know, platform matures, is uh, an area that we might start branching off into. One area that we're really excited about is um, flipping the model of paying for games on its head a little bit and doing a, a form of stake to, pay, uh, to play where you can leverage the actual Alchemix system to finance paying for games without actually having to, you know, purchase a game or, you know, having to pay for all these like, you know, microtransactions and stuff like that. Instead, you would just say, hey, I deposit a couple hundred die and then I get to play this game as long as I have my deposit in there instead. So that's uh, something that we're, we're pretty excited about. Um, but that, that's down the line um, as far as stuff like that goes. And then, you know, long, long term goals is, you know, for AlUSD, we we hope that we can become one of, if not the top uh, decentralized stable coin out there. Um, it's sort of like a, a meta stable coin, too. In the future, it will be when we have multi collateral AlUSD. So it'll be like a composite of all the, the stable coins. Right now, we have around 300 and uh, 330 million AlUSD out there. I think it'd be really cool if we can get over a billion. Um, so that's, uh, you know, one of our goals is to get over a billion dollars of AlUSD out there, uh, if not more. 
That could be cool. If we could take um, MakerDAO as the top decentralized stablecoin, that would be really cool. I don't know if we can get that far, but, you know, that would be cool. And what do you see as some of the biggest risks facing you guys, especially from, uh, you know, what can competition do as well? Like, what happens if Maker says, hey, we're going to start taking Y assets? So, like, you know, like a derivative of what of a urine deposit and like accept that as collateral. How does that change the dynamics of the Alchemic system? Yeah, we're already starting to see that a little bit. I know Cream was uh, playing around with the idea of allowing Y assets as collateral. I think uh, Unit Protocol is also playing around with that as well. Um, but they still would be different from Alchemix uh, because when you borrow their their stable coins, you're still getting charged interest. So if I borrow USDP, I'm going to be getting charged 12%. If I borrow Dai, I think it's something like 5 or 6% right now. I'm not entirely sure. Whereas with us, you, you're not going to have to pay interest on the LUSD. Um, instead, your collateral is going to be paying off that, that debt over time. So I think that's something unique uh, for Alchemix in the way that we constructed our system uh, that other people, uh, you know, they would either have to clone us to, to replicate it for, for the, their own apps. But isn't this interest important in these systems because it's what helps bring the price back to a peg and it's like, or, or be, because if people like, you know, you, you want to like kind of incentivize people to pay off their debt and like having this interest is kind of what does that without requiring people to pay off their debt and like have an interest. How do you kind of get people to want to pay off their debt? Yeah. So if LUSD is off the peg and it's uh, cheaper, you, you know, and let, let's say like you borrowed it at one point and you sold it for a dollar and then later on it's like 97 cents. You could be like, hey, I'm going to, you know, buy this LUSD off the market because it's at a discount right now and I can pay off my debt for cheap, like for cheaper than I would have been able to otherwise. Um, so that is a, a pegging mo module or mechanism right there. And then it's just like, you know, arbitrage through the transmitter is, is the other um, aspect right there that helps uh, balance the peg out. And, and the fact that, like, you know, we're, instead of like people paying 12%, you know, for interest, you know, we're having that 12% paid by yearn essentially. And then that's going into the transmitter. So that that's that, the transmitter, the money in there is sort of like this buffer that says like, Hey, if you know, the peg is, is, you know, you know, at risk, then people are going to go in the transmitter and then, you know, use that as the method to, you know, convert their LUSD or that they're going to arbit uh, from the curve pool and stuff like that and make money off of it. And those, those uh, together, they, they all, you know, so far, everything seems to be indicating that those uh, those mechanisms are working uh, to maintain the peg for it. I think one of the other things that makes uh, Dai peg so strong and SUSD always have a premium is the fact that you know they are in demand assets in, D in DeFi, whether that's through yield farming or you know uh, using them as um, assets and other things um, or in other protocols. I think that's what you know is driving the the high price for you know the premium for Dai and the premium for uh, SUSD is the fact that they're useful and they're used everywhere. And I think if we can get that going for uh, LUSD, then you know we'll have we'll take care of the demand side uh, of it uh, even stronger. So is this going to be enough to incentivize and, and keep the peg strong long term? I am leaning towards yes, um, but I guess we won't really know until the bear market hits. And we'll see what happens to the yields on chains. Um, like my worry is if yields go up like under 5%. I think that we would still be fine at around 5%, but under 5% is where I might start getting, uh, might start to worry about the uh, effectiveness of the system and the safety of it. So uh, not the safety, but more the stability of it. But I think if we take care of the demand side, then all the other fears about depegging are going to, you know, be diminished uh, significantly. Doesn't this also create like a free, you can leverage on like your yearn yields. So like, because if let's say I take it, I, I take my die, put it in Alchemix, borrow 50% of LUSD. But now if the LUSD is trading at one to one with die, I could go trade that for more die, put that in Alchemix again and take out LUSD. And then I can keep doing this process again and again. And I'm essentially going to be earning, I, I basically got a free 
2x leverage on my die. And this means I just doubled my yearn earnings, right? Yes, so that, that would uh, mean the same thing. Yes, you, you can lever up to 2x. The efficiency gets down every single step. Imagine that you start at a, 100 and you're trying to get up to 200. So your next step is 150. Then from 150, you can go to 175. Then you can go to 187. And then, you know, from there. So, like, you know, it depends on your, your size um, and how efficient that's going to be. Uh, but yes, that is something you can do. That's also why we have a 200% uh, collateralization ratio. If it were um, any less than this uh, recursive, uh, you know, borrowing strategy could easily go up to like five, six, seven, eight X. And that, that would be, you know, I think unfair for other users in the system because essentially they would be um, taking yield from other people, if that makes sense. How does the equilibrium of this work out? Like, the, is the rational thing for everyone to do is that everyone should be doing this, right? And then what happens if everyone does this? Do, does, this, does the yearn earnings per die just half what's the equilibrium of this scenario it seems like it's something that everyone should be doing by default in fact urine itself should be doing um, this right? I, I, don't, I disagree with that i don't think everyone should be doing that by default um but anyway let me like let me get to that so if like the urine vault what i think what makes them special and different from other yield aggregators is that they're scalable because they can add any uh, arbitrary amount of uh, strategies uh, to their vault and that allows it so like you know no one yield provider gets overwhelmed by by urine's uh, TVL coming into it. And you know we've seen like when we first started the the YV die vault had like I think like twenty or thirty uh, million in it, and now it has over six hundred million in it. And yet the yields have still held up very 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 well. And I, I you know, attribute urine's uh, brilliance and engineering and their strategist for uh, making that happen. So I don't think the the yield uh, the year the yields from urine would collapse in that scenario. But what would happen is the yields in alchemics would go down because right now there is, um, we have the transmuter um, and the, the dye that that's holding and the yield that that's uh, passing on to it. And right now uh, there's about, you know, a similar amount of dye in the uh, transmuter that's in the, um, the alchemist vaults. And because of that, it's basically doubling urine's APY because we have like twice the amount of uh, principal. And if a lot of people were doing this uh, leveraged, uh, recursive leverage strategy, then it would uh, throw that balance out and be, make it a little bit more heavier towards the vault side instead of the uh, transmuter side. And because of that, that would um, lower the um, relative amount of principle that the, uh, the transmuter has in relation to the vault, which would lower uh, yields for everybody in the system. Uh, but it wouldn't lower the income of the system. In fact, that would probably go up. Um, if there was more in the, uh, the, you know, more aggregate die in the system and, you know, that, that die that they're borrowing and that they're leveraging and everything like that, that's still locked as collateral. So that's going to be uh, sending yield to the transmuter uh, this whole while and everything like that. So that, uh, should work out as long as like the collateralization ratio isn't uh, too low, then I don't think this uh, recursive strategy is, uh, is, is damaging to the system. Uh, but if everyone were to do it, it could have some unintended consequences and uh, maybe destabilize the peg uh, uh, you know, temporarily at times, in my opinion. I think long term, it might actually be healthier for the peg because that means there's more die locked in the system and more guaranteed you know, yield coming into it. So it's not quite a neutral thing. It's slightly negative, but not that negative for, the, for people to be using the strategy, in my opinion. And I also think that, like, you know, speculating on altcoins, you know, or or trying to farm in other stablecoins using the, the stuff that you borrow is is also, you know, really popular and viable strategy. So I don't see a lot of people doing the, uh, the recursive strategy. One question I had was about community. Uh, obviously, having a token, ALCX token, uh, so quickly kind of community is one of the most important things for Alchemix long-term success. How do you think about like attracting a community, keeping people very engaged? And you, you've mentioned the team a few times. How do you see like the team as distinct from the community? And what's your long-term plans for, for decentralization and, and, and governance for Alchemix? 
So um, we love our community. We have a, a Discord and um, we try to make our Discord a lightly moderated place um, so people can have fun and they can, you know, shit post and, and enjoy in there. And we have lots of funny and silly emojis in there that people use and stuff like that. So uh, we, we our community is really good. Our, we have a, a community manager, um, Gorby, who set up our Discord and um, we engage with them um, like daily. Um, I get in there, answer questions and, and post along with everyone else. We actually even have a, a sub community that was created inside of Alchemics. They're called the Yunts, and uh, they just theorize like all this DGen stuff that you can do with Alchemics and other apps in in connection with Alchemics and stuff like that. And they just you know, they post about it in a uh, DGen channel in our Discord. One way that we uh, engage them is that you know like us in the core team, like we might come up with like a, a plan or an outline of uh, some things that we want to do or some changes that we make. But then we'll uh, we'll go to the community and our Discord and our forum, and uh, we'll, we'll ask for comments, and then you know we'll we'll launch into a big debate, and then we'll try to find consensus among everybody, and then um, you know once we have some good options or we have consensus, we'll take it to uh, the snapshot to um, to make it official, and then we'll execute uh, you know in accordance with the community's wishes at that time. Um, it's a little bit centralized, but I think we're, we're doing a pretty good job of involving our community um, and keeping them in the loop and keeping them involved with, uh, you know, uh, making decisions. And I think that's good for, um, you know, getting them uh, involved and keeping them sticky in our community. Occasionally I'll go in there and I'll, we have a tip bot and I'll, I'll make it rain if, if I'm feeling generous. <laughs> Uh, especially like if somebody's contributing, if I notice somebody has been like in our support channel and like, you know, been helping out a bunch of newcomers, like, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll throw them a tip or if somebody makes a really dank meme, I'll throw them a tip, things like that. And I think stuff like that and people seeing like just like kind of random acts of generosity inspire other people to do that. So like what I've seen now is like people I've tipped for their work in the protocol are now tipping other people. So it's like this sort of like generous or this virtuous cycle going on. And I think that's uh, helping our community um, a lot. Going forward uh, for Alchemix and how we're going to decentralize is uh, later this year, we're going to be launching Alchemix DAO, and that's going to basically remove the dev stranglehold on power. Uh, so we're going to ditch the uh, the multi-sig, uh, you know, and snapshot format, and it's going to go straight to like on-chain governance and everything like that. And at that point, Anything we want to do, like, we're not going to be able to force anything. Everything's going to have to go through the DAO for better or worse. And we're going to go into that. Right now, we're still, like, in our early phase, in our growth phase. And I think having the, the multi-sig and time lock and the flexibility of that is better. It allows us to move a little bit faster and, you know, conduct deals and things like that and help us get uh, started. But uh, we're, we're planning to grow up and get our community becoming the owners of the protocol itself. And uh, the DAO, hopefully the, the DAO I'm designing is going to be highly engaging and uh, get everybody in there and, and active and give them reason to, to be active as well. And so tell us a bit about your uh, exiting news. Oh, God, man, I'm a typo machine. <laughs> Stop that. <laughs> my exiting views, my what I'm excited about or what I'm exiting about. Uh... <laughs> yeah, just curious to learn about like, you know, what, so, you know, you guys did a raise after sort of the launch of the token and protocol and stuff. So, you know, really interested to learn about like how that process goes and like, you know, it is, you know, most teams tend to usually do like raise money from investors pre launch of a token. So how, how did that process differ, especially when, you know, you guys are also like, you know, mostly a non and stuff. And so what, what was the fund? What was this like very unique fundraising process like? Yeah, so this all started because um, before we launched Alchemix, um, I, I needed to, to uh, have like a job done to help us uh, get the everything ready before launch. And so I contracted another developer and said, hey, can you get this done for me? Um, it's, it's urgent and it's a little bit beyond my skill level. And I said, sure. It's like, yeah. And I told him at the time, back when, before we launched, when I thought a price of an ALCX token was like 15 bucks. Uh, yeah, I'll pay you 100 ALCX to get this job done. <laughs> and then we, after we launched, we mooned. And at the time, uh, I, I sent this guy his 100 ALCX. Uh, ALCX was worth, I think, like $800. So what I thought was going to be like a $1,500 payment turned into like an $80,000 payment. And then the guy I sent it to, um, he uh, cashed it out. 
like immediately um, and sold it for uh, for I think ETH. And um, then people were wa- monitoring the dev wallets and they're like, the devs are rugging, the devs are rugging. And I'm like, no, no, I just promised somebody a payment before we launched and I'm just making good on my word. And uh, because of that, we, we, we realized that we were like under a microscope. Every single thing that we were uh, doing, um, any movement of our funds, uh, everything was going to be heavily scrutinized. And we thought like, if we're going to, you know, we, like in our, a lot of our team was still working uh, a day job at the time. We, we had been developing this in our spare time since, uh, you know, midsummer. So for the team to quit their day jobs, they'd have to cash out some ALCX in order to have enough funds to, you know, support them and their families and stuff. And seeing the reaction to the market and the community when, you know, I, I sent those tokens to the other dev who cashed them out and they thought that we were rugging. I was like, we have to, we have a, we have to find a different way. Uh, luckily I'm in, um, eGirl Capital and they were one of our, uh, like they contributed to our initial liquidity pool on Sushi Swap. Um, and there's, a, they have a lot of people in there that are traders and developers and are really, really well connected into the ecosystem. And I asked them, I was like, Hey, do you think you could help us try to find some OTC partners? Cause we thought if we went OTC, um, you know, we wouldn't have the, these problems with people freaking out, thinking that we were rugging and stuff like that and dumping on sushi. So, um, they hooked us up with a number of uh, players in the space that were all interested in getting ALCX anyway. And, uh, we struck out a deal. At the time, the, the price of ALCX was like 750 or $800. And we, uh, you know, we settled on a price of $700 for the OTC. So overall, pretty good. The investors, uh, they got in a slight discount and we didn't, uh, you know, dump the market. So I think it was a pretty good win-win situation. And those funds allowed the team to, uh, you know, quit their day jobs completely. So, and go full time. So that was really important for us. Um, and then during those negotiations, some other investors jumped in and said, hey, we'd also like to lead a strategic round um, w- with Alchemix. And uh, so we, we worked out a deal with them and that was using the, the DAO's funds itself. So uh, that seeded our DAO with over $3 million of capital. Um, so it's giving us a lot of flexibility for you know paying for audits and uh, other expenses that are coming up uh, as well. Uh, between those two deals, uh, you know, the team is taken care of and uh, the, the protocol is um, in good shape going forward. I think if our app wasn't compelling and novel and something new, we probably would not have ever been offered this, uh, these deals. So I think that that's, you know, you know, is a uh, very flattering and very nice, you know, uh, for our protocol that they would consider to invest in anonymous devs. I also think that maybe because I have a little bit of clout and reputation in the space and I'm connected to, you know, people like eGirl Capital, that that also probably made investors a little bit more comfortable uh, investing with us. So, you know, I don't know if other Anons could pull this off. They might not be as, you know, as connected as Scoopy Truple is. Can you tell us a little bit about what eGirl Capital is? Yeah, we're um, a, a, just a, it's just a group of, um, Anons and, and, and people who we have a couple of docs members as well. Um, and so we are like we together, we form like we're all our own individual LPs. Um, and together we, we form our own little kind of like ad hoc uh, decentralized VC, not really decentralized. Uh, we're not a DAO or anything like that per se, but um, uh, we try to find ecosystem uh, projects that are interesting to us. Um, that are, are cool. We're not just like there to, you know, invest in things and, and flip it and take profits and stuff like that. But we want to find uh, projects that we think are cool or move the, the space forward. And then uh, we pull our funds together and we invest. And um, so far we've done Radical, Alchemix, Unisox. Um, that was more of a liquid token investment. And uh, Arbitrum and uh, Yet. Yes, so those are the uh, the investments that we have at, as eGirl right now. We we've actually turned down a lot of things it's just because uh, you know we wanted to kind of distinguish ourselves as people you know who are more allies of the ecosystem instead of people who are just out there to you know make a quick buck and flip uh, tokens and stuff like that. That's a very eclectic uh, set of investments, it is. but I guess it fits yeah. for a very eclectic set of uh, LPs. It's it's very very eclectic. Like uh, the e girl chat is just a a really wild and random place where we go from talking to DeFi to talking to 
to women and girls, and then we talk about, <laughs> um, and then we talk about like DGEN's trading, and then you know insider news, like all sorts of stuff, just gets talked about there, and it's like. You know, because there's a few devs in there, there's uh, myself included, we have uh, professional traders, uh, people, you know, like CL, um, you know, and uh, Jeff Wang. Um, and we also have just like DeFi power users, like uh, DGen Spartan is in there as well. So like, it's just a very good eclectic mix. We actually have some girls in eGirl. Um, shout out to Ava Balin. Uh, she's really, you know, helped us organize and, and turn it into a reality. Uh, before her, we were just e-girls and now we are e-queens. <laughs> so it's a really fun place. It's really cool. It's exciting. Um, and it's definitely been something that's, uh, you know, helped Alchemix, uh, because, you know, they've been able to connect us with a, a lot of good people that have helped us as well. Yeah. And I think we're coming up to near the end of our time. Um, so is any, you know, I guess you already talked a little bit about the future of uh, Alchemix, but is there anything else you want, you know, the listeners to know about and what's coming up next for uh, Alchemix? Yeah, so um, there's actually a lot of stuff coming up right now. Our audit um, just got back. Uh, we're just sending it back to our auditor real quick to get it finalized and everything like that. Um, everything came back uh, looking good. Um, and that's going to give us the green light to get on to uh, Curve.Fi. Um, also getting um, insurance options for Alchemix. So those are some uh, developments that are going to coming in uh, sometime over the next week or so. And then shortly thereafter, we're going to be launching um, Al ETH. So, uh, you know, towards the end of May, there's going to be a decent amount of stuff coming uh, going on with Alchemix. Then we'll probably have a little bit of a quiet period as we are going heads down on uh, getting V2 ready for launch. Um, you know, sometime towards the end of July or early August is uh, what we're aiming for. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, uh, the next few months of Alchemix right there. Um, if there's any more developments, we'll be sure to, to tweet them very loudly from our Twitter. Yeah. Thanks so much, Scoopy. Uh, how can users get started if they want to interact with Alchemix? Yeah. So you can go to alchemix.fi. That's our, uh, our homepage. It can, uh, there's links to the app there. Um, and, uh, you know, the app is, uh, I think pretty straightforward to use. There's tutorial videos linked on the website itself. And if that's too hard, uh, then find us on discord and get involved or ask questions on there. And, you know, there'll be plenty of people there willing to help you out. All right, cool. Thanks so much. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, the guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.